right now on VFN TV. We're going to go to the Value Voter Summit. Joel Rosenberg. It's so exciting, so encouraging and inspiring. This man has written novels before, but it seems like he's tapping into prophetic future history right now on VFN TV. Be sure to subscribe and press alert to get new notifications of new success secrets made available on VFN TV. Welcome to VFN TV. I'm Greg Lancaster. Of course, joining me is John Raymond. Hello. What's happening, man? Man, I'm excited about our program. It's packed, man. As a matter of fact, we're going to go straight to the Value Voter Summit with Joel Rosenberg, who has dual citizenship in America and, and Israel, Israel. But he has so many novels that he's written. They're like tapping into prophetic. He doesn't acknowledge it, but it's like, man, this it's thing awesome. is real. As a matter of fact, let's go to the Value Voter Summit right now with Joel Rosenberg. We are Jewish people who love Jesus. We are Americans who are now living in Israel as Israeli citizens. We are uh, evangelicals who love not only Israel, but Israel's neighbors. And uh, are trying to learn what it means. What did Jesus mean when he said, love your neighbors? And you say, well, those aren't neighbors over there, you know, Syria, Iran, you know, whatever. They're, they're, they're enemies. Okay, well, Jesus said, love your enemies. Oh, come on, Lord. You know, that covers everybody then. Neighbors? Enemies? Okay. So how do you do that? And that has been one of the most fascinating challenges of our lives, trying to figure out how do you walk with Jesus and for him in the land where he lived, but, you know, he came to his own, his own received him not, but to as many as did receive him, to them he gives the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So... That's a challenge anywhere. It's a challenge uh, in Lebanon. It's a challenge in, in, in Colorado if you're a baker. It's a, you know, it's a challenge everywhere. But, I want, but Tony asked me to come back this time to talk about uh, sort of a, from our unique perspective, I guess, uh, what is happening in the Middle East? What are some of the key challenges there? And what are some of the things that are encouraging that evangelicals need to know but might not be getting from the mainstream media. And I said, how much time are you gonna give me? So anyway, so in the time that we have, I, I wanna pick one particular uh, positive development and then frame it uh, with a few other uh, stories and, 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 uh, and facts that, that I see happening in the region today. First of all, I, I do wanna say how much has changed, uh, what has happened in the last three years, just since you know I, I was here last, uh, the world has change in our part of the world. The Islamic state, as it existed three years ago, no longer exists. The caliphate has been crushed. The genocide against Christians in the Middle East has been stopped. ISIS has not been va vanquished, but it is definitely on the run. Israel has just celebrated her 70th anniversary of her prophetic rebirth on May 14th, 1948. Jewish families, like my own, are returning back to the Promised Land, back to the Holy Land, after centuries of exile, just as the scriptures foretold. It's happening in our lifetime. Israel is building a prosperous economy and a vibrant, robust, dynamic democracy. And 23 years after Congress overwhelmingly passed a law to make it happen, the American embassy now resides in Jerusalem. Now that's not just in the last three years, that's the last 18 months. And I think, you know, I, I, I need to be honest with you all, uh, we, we are evangelicals, so we ought to be honest with each other, right? So I was a never Trumper until Thursday, not, not last Thursday, but the Thursday before the election, okay? <laughs> I had to send in my absentee ballot from Israel by FedEx, and, and I had been quite outspoken about my concerns and criticisms of the candidate Trump. But it did come down, uh, you know, it was him or her now. There were, you know, 16 other options were gone. There was nothing else was going to happen. This is it. You got to send in your ballot, and it's him or her. And so I knew what she was going to be, and I wasn't sure what I was going to get, what we were going to get. Some were early adopters, yourselves included perhaps, but I was late in the game. Uh, because, and my, but there were many reasons, and I actually posted that day 
uh, on that Thursday uh, a column just on my own blog uh, with what were the decisions, how did I get to this point? Because I had been vocal. And uh, what I didn't write, because my wife made me take it off, she thought you should just focus on your actual main substance. But there was one other, and that was um, that my wife had said, All right, you're, just to be clear, you're going to vote against a ticket where one of the people on the ticket actually has read your novels and likes them? That's your plan? Uh, that would be Mike Pence, uh, who uh, Mike and Karen, are, uh, we are friends, uh, Lynn and I, with them. And now to see him as the vice president of the United States uh, in such a key role, helping the president uh, with these type of issues, it's really quite extraordinary. I didn't write that in the column. But, uh, you know, people are policy. And when you see someone like Secretary Pompeo, another reader of the novels, but whatever, um, <laughs> when you see him as the Director of Central Intelligence and then the Secretary of State uh, leading U.S. foreign policy, explaining it, advancing it, working with the President, this is just amazing to see evangelicals in these key positions. Not that evangelicals need to be in every key position, but it's kind of encouraging that people who have these values and, have, and, are, and are so concerned about the direction of the country are, um, are in key positions. And they are making progress. And I, I said on CNN early on when the administration started, listen, I'm an evangelical, so even though that was not a marriage with the president coming into power, like, I think of it like a marriage that I wasn't sure should happen, honestly. But now that it's happened, I want it to succeed. There will be times that criticism is necessary. But there's a difference between being a critic and being a cynic, right? And there are times to be critical, but if you are a cynic, that means you don't believe somebody can ever change, ever make good decisions, ever hire good people, ever advance our values, and that clearly is not the case. Uh, so much good has happened, and I am grateful, especially because I live in a, in a tough neighborhood now. now what I want to focus in, in just a few minutes we have here together as we close out this session is the number one threat in the region uh, is no longer ISIS. I wrote a whole series of, uh, of novels about ISIS. And that, the first one came out before ISIS had really become a big deal. And, and yet that is no longer the, the, the primary threat. The primary threat is and remains and will be for the foreseeable future Iran. Now, we all know this, so I'm not going to recount all the disastrous uh, implications of the Iran nuclear deal. The 100 to $150 billion in cash that were just given to a bunch of terrorists so they could do more terrorism. Uh, the, the way that this deal has emboldened the Ayatollahs of Iran to uh, not only repress their own people, including Christians, uh, but to expand their terrorist empire all over the region. And Iran now effectively controls four Arab capitals, Beirut, Lebanon, Damascus, Syria, Baghdad, Iraq, and Sana'a, the capital of Yemen. That's just in the last few years that this, this uh, effort has, has taken hold and th this level of influence and aggression and evil, true wickedness coming out of Iran has been encouraged by the nuclear deal. Now, we could spend an entire message just on the evils of it, but I want to talk about something that is less noticed, but is very important for Americans generally, for the West, and for evangelicals in particular, I think. And that is how the Iran threat, not just the nuclear threat, but the ballistic missile threat, the terrorism threat, the repression of minorities, and, and, and including Christians. How is that changing the region? Oh, this is so exciting. We're going to be able to come back from this break in just a moment. We're going to hear about some divine encounters he's had literally with the president of Egypt and how that led him to the king of of Jordan, this is amazing what's taking place. Um, this, is a, this is a major moment right now in world history. Join us after the break. We'll be right back. In the early morning hours of November 10, 1938, Jews experienced events of a night long remembered when in Germany and Austria, they endured Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. 
thousands of Jewish businesses were destroyed, over a thousand synagogues burned down, and 30,000 men between the ages of 16 and 60 arrested, sent off to concentration camps or prison. The Nazi regime enacted a devastating law for Jewish immigration, an exorbitant fine that if not paid, Jews would be required to leave behind all their possessions before a single Jew was allowed to leave Germany. We know now that it was only the ominous beginning of the Holocaust to come. Yet throughout this horrific period, Jews relied on the Bible as a source of strength and hope. Engage with this book of books. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. You know, a lot of people want to abide with the Lord, but they just don't have a plan to do it. You can request that plan today at iabide.org. Can a public school exclude Christian groups from using their facilities? This is Law and Justice with Jay Sekulow. Yeah, I would like to know if facilities form at a public school can state that religious activities or religious organizations are prohibited from using facilities. Absolutely not. We've litigated that case now three times at the Supreme Court of the United States. The first time we won it in an eight to one decision. The second time the case was unanimous. Even the third time, which was an elementary school level case, we won six to three overwhelmingly. So the answer is no. There cannot be a religious exclusion from access to a generally available public facility. If they allow community groups to utilize these facilities, they cannot deny a Christian group from utilizing those facilities because their message is one that has religious connotation, religious thought, or religious belief. Join the American Center for Law and Justice in defending our religious liberties. Find out more at aclj.org. That's aclj.org. Welcome back to VFN TV with your host, Greg Lancaster. Welcome, welcome back. We're at the Value Voters Summit with Joel Rosenberg. Yes, the author, but he's about to talk about some divine encounters he's had from Egypt's, Egypt's president yes. to the King of Jordan. Let's go there now. One of the ways it, has ch it is changing the region is by causing every leader in the region, I'm talking particularly about the Sunni Arab leaders, to fundamentally rethink who is their friend and who is their foe. Okay? This is, this is a big deal. And it, it, it's something dramatic and, and almost unnoticed by most people, unless you live in the region or are super focused on the region. Every alliance is being shaken and reshaped by the, by, the, by the growing, the rising Iran threat. So let me give you an example. So when I was born in 1967, the leader of the Sunni Arab world was the president of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, right? This was a fire-breathing uh, Arab nationalist who was threatening to throw the Jews into the sea, right? We're going to invade Israel, we're going to kill everybody and drive them out, and we're going to reconquer that land. And he built an alliance to make that happen. And when I was two months old, uh, Nasser was about to invade and annihilate the little country of Israel. And Israel had to strike first, and did. And as you know, uh, in six days, they almost quadrupled their territory. They reunified Jerusalem, and on the seventh day, they rested. <laughs> now, now, where are we today? Okay, so that's the world uh, that I was born into 51 years ago. Egypt was the leader, and Egypt was the enemy, and Egypt was buying Russian, you know, Soviet weaponry, using Soviet tactics, buying Russian uh, Air, you know, Air Force jets, Russian advisors, where are we today? A couple, uh, two years ago, no, just last year, just last year, just before Passover, as it turned out, I happened to be in Washington finishing up a book tour uh, for my last uh, thriller. That last year was without warning. It was the end of the ISIS series. And I got invited to a meeting with the new president of Egypt, uh, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. Now, i have been intrigued with him. i have been watching what was going on with him. Of course, I'd never met him, and, but I got invited to a meeting. There was about 60 Middle East experts, and I got included. So that was, it was fascinating to hear two hours of his briefing and uh, including our questions. But at the end of it, we all expected the president and his entourage to get up and walk out. 
because that's what you do. You're done with your meeting, you move. But he got up and started to chat with people. Nobody knew what to do. And many, of them, many people in the room had a lot more seniority. They were former somebodies, you know, former secretary of this or director of that. I'm just a novelist, right? I just make things up for a living. So <laughs> thought if he's, you know, so everyone was a little, you know, they all knew the diplomatic niceties. I didn't. So I just thought, great, he's chatting with people. I'd like to meet him. So I moved around. The Secret Service didn't stop me. Suddenly, I'm shaking hands with President El Sisi. Now, I, I thanked him for this time. I thanked him for rescuing the people of Egypt from the Muslim Brotherhood. He liberated 100 million people from one of the most radical regimes on the planet. It, I, 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 we'd be hard-pressed to think of another example where a country has been rescued from the clutches of a radical Islamist regime. So I thanked him for that. I thanked him for all he's done to protect Christians. I thanked him for reaching out to Christians, for spending time with uh, the Coptic Christian Pope. Uh, he doesn't really sell it, you know, he's a Muslim, so he doesn't celebrate Christian, but Christmas, but he goes and, and honors them on their, on their Christmas uh, celebrations. Um, he's put uh, soldiers around churches when necessary, and, and, and it's been necessary. He's reached out to the Catholic Pope. He's reached out to Jewish leaders. So I thanked him for all those things, and no one still was coming to, so I had a few more moments, so I said, you know, one group I haven't noticed that you've met with, and I may have missed it, so please forgive me, um, but have you met with evangelical Christian leaders? And he said, no, I, I have not. I said, well, you may want to consider that. Uh, there are some 60 million evangelicals in the United States, some uh, 600 million worldwide, and we talked about that for a few minutes, and I said, I think they would be fascinated, we would be fascinated to have a meeting similar to this where you share your view because, we, because you're new and we don't know you and we want to know you. You want a strong, you know, you're, you're not Nasser, right? You want a strong relationship with the United States. You want to reinvigorate the, the, uh, the peace process with Israel. You are trying to help uh, solve the, the crisis in Gaza. You are fighting radical Islam. You're a, they're the type of leader that I would make up in a novel if you didn't exist. So he brightened, and I, he, said, uh, he said, well, would you like to bring a delegation to come to Cairo and, and meet with me? And I said, I would be honored to do that. And uh, this took all of about nine minutes to have this conversation, and he turned to the foreign minister, the uh, uh, ambassador, and to his uh, chief of staff, and he said, make it happen. <laughs> so... We exchanged information, and I flew back to Israel, and the next day was Passover. So I'm, I'm at the next-door neighbor's house with my neighbors, and we're having Passover. Now, you know the story, right? Jews enslaved in Egypt. Moses goes to the leader of Egypt. So they're like, well, how did this happen? I, I said, I can't tell you exactly how this happened. But I can tell you that imagine a Jewish man standing before the leader of Egypt on the eve of Passover and saying, let my people come. That's not how the story goes the way I remember it. So now for a few months, I started thinking, well, maybe this isn't going to happen. Maybe, you know, he'll harden his heart. But anyway, it happened. And I want to thank my dear friend, Tony Perkins, and my dear friend, General Jerry Boykin, because they joined me on that delegation. We not only met with senior Muslim leaders and with 60 Egyptian Christian leaders to hear their stories and how can we pray for you? How can we encourage you? But we, the first meeting we had at their insistence, the government's insistence, was with the president in the palace. We were supposed to have an hour. We had almost three. And Iran was one of the main topics that he wanted to talk about. Iran is causing, Iran and all the radicalism that goes with it, is causing leaders like el-Sisi to rethink what they want. We see this in Jordan. We have to take the delegation. Uh, I had... The King, King Abdullah had read one of my novels several years ago. It, it happened to be that he was one of the characters in the novel, and that ISIS in the novel is trying to kill him and overthrow his kingdom. And I, wrote, I, I made him a character by name. I'm not that bright. So, now, rather than, now, an advisor read the book, I, I didn't know the advisor, and he didn't know me, 
but he, he read the book. Then he gave it to the king and said, you have to read this. He said, why? He said, because you're in it. He said, what are you talking about? It's a novel. He goes, I know, but you're a character. What? So as it happened, he, uh, the king read, uh, it happened to be the second in the series. It was a book called The First Hostage. And uh, he, the king read the book, King Abdullah II, and, and rather than banning me from the kingdom forever, <laughs> he invited my wife and me to come for five days to build a friendship, to begin to get to know his worldview. And, and I, though he didn't say it, I felt like he, he sent us to meet with all his special forces generals and different bases and key leaders, national security leaders. I think he was saying, I want to show you what I'm doing to make sure your books never come true. <laughs> we had three different meetings with him, including uh, the last night I was there, a uh, two and a half hour dinner, private dinner with him in his palace. And a big portion of our conversation was on Iran. Now, as it happened, I said to him at the, the dinner, listen, this is so fascinating. We are so honored. I mean, I mean, now, just time out for one second. Let me just say, but think about this. You, you might read a book by somebody, a novel, if you're in it. And uh, you might read it otherwise. But if you're, he's a Muslim monarch. He's a 43rd generation direct descendant of the prophet Muhammad. Now, to invite an American, Israeli, Jewish follower of Jesus to your kingdom for five days, that's not normal. <laughs> and I, we were so honored. And I said to him, listen, I, I feel like one of those lepers in the Bible that if, I, if people find out I got to do this and I didn't share the blessing with others, I'm going to get in trouble. And would you be open to having other evangelical leaders come? So as it worked out, not only did he want to do that, but it worked out that we took the delegation for five days to Egypt and then four days in Jordan. We met with all the top officials. We met with three dozen Jordanian evangelicals just alone, not with any government, just to hear their stories, what their challenges are, how to pray for them. And then we had a working lunch at the palace with the king. And Iran was a topic. Now, I, I don't have time to go through every leader in the region, but I want to draw your attention, just as in closing, to the new crown prince of Saudi Arabia. I'm not saying all these men are doing everything right. I'm saying that the crown prince of Saudi Arabia has called the Ayatollah of Iran the new Hitler. That he, is, that he wants a strong relationship with the United States. That he is making reforms. He is making changes. There's a lot to reform. It's Saudi Arabia. But we need to watch this. We need to encourage what's right and respectfully have conversations in, behind closed doors with he and other leaders about reforms that still need to be made, including religious freedom, including the opportunity for Christians to, to live and operate freely. But what is, there, there's many dynamics. Iran's not the only dynamic, but every leader in the region, the United Arab Emirates, a fascinating, increasingly tolerant and moderate uh, government. I'm getting to know his, the ambassador from the United Arab Emirates. A fascinating man, fascinating country, Bahrain. These countries realize that the threat to the region is not the United States. It's not Israel, even. It's not Christianity. It's Iran and Iran's radical Islamism. And it's, re, it's causing a fundamental recalculation of every leader in that region. Who is my friend and who is my foe? Now, I, I make this stuff up in novels, but this is real life. Things are happening. Russia is forming an alliance with Iran, Turkey, Qatar. So to the north, wickedness, evil, danger. To the south, something new. An American-Israeli-Sunni Arab alliance. It's not perfect. It's not fully formed. But something's happening that has never happened in history. We need to encourage it. We need to nurture it. We need to be grateful that this current administration understands it in a way that the last administration certainly did not. And we need to continue to pray for peace in the region, peace for Jerusalem, and that we can be salt and light in every aspect of life, from foreign policy to human rights and the gospel, most importantly. It's an honor to come and share just a little bit of what's happening in my part of the world. May God bless you, and may God bless this dear country that I love so much. Amen.
Such a powerful, powerful man, right? Yes. Now. Listen, this is what's really been exciting days right now. What's happening in the region and to know that we're all alive right now on this earth witnessing these historic events makes us want to be informed, want us to be prayerful. And I'm so grateful for Joel. He reminds us that at any moment, listen, if we're steadfast with the Lord, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, keep, keeping our ear attentive to what he's telling us, we can be at the right place at the right time to be used in powerful ways to be able to bring 60 evangelical leaders to meet with yes. the president of Egypt, Al-Sisi. Mm. These are historic moments yeah. to be able to bring a delegation to King Abdullah in Jordan. Historical, biblical proportion moments and it inspires me, I'm sure it inspires you, it should inspire you at home to be able to say, listen, for such a time as this, at any moment God can use you for, you know, to do anything and to bring change into the seven spears and mountains that we talk about all the time through VFN Kingdom Business. But it's now more than ever, I believe it's so important for us to continue to pray for Israel and uh, for our alliance, the church and our nation to stand strong with them. Do you remember when President Trump went to Saudi Arabia? Yes, I do. Pop. Tell us about that. Listen, he went over there on his very first historic trip and uh, went to Saudi Arabia. He went over to Israel, but it was quite different from the trip that President Barack Obama went. When President Barack Obama went, it was almost like an apology tour. And some would say that he actually bowed to the, to the king. But when President Trump came, I mean, they rolled out the red carpet. There was such respect for yes. America again. And you saw that there was an alliance that was already forming there. The previous administration decided to join forces with Iran and cut that deal. But this administration, President Trump's administration, lined up with the, the, the Saudi Arabian government. Which Joel's talking about. Yes. And, and not just Saudi Arabia with the United States, but the United States with Israel. So this is a yeah. beautiful thing that's happening in, in the God. region. And I believe it's gonna bring peace and stability. John, can you close us out in prayer? Yes, listen, we wanna pray with you. Of course, always leave comments below for us. We'd love to hear your comments. But let's just pray too. together. Yeah, write to us. The friends let's at VFNKB.com. Friends at VFNKB.com. Lord, we just thank you again for this wonderful opportunity to be with our audience and be able to discuss all these important things that are happening. Be sure to subscribe and press alert to get new notifications of new success secrets made available on VFN TV. You know, a lot of people want to abide with the Lord, but they just don't have a plan to do it. You can request that plan today at iabide.org. I'm your host, Greg Lancaster, and we're so glad that you've joined us. Don't forget you can join us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Download our app and sign up for our newsletter, The Torch, at vfnkb.com. I've enjoyed our time together. God bless.